Once again, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, in any case, I wanted to share with you, alhamdulillah, tonight. I was really happy that actually the ayat from Surah Al-Furqan were recited because though they're not the subject of my talk with you, they are very much related to the subject of my talk with you. There are three passages in the Quran in which Allah gives us what you can call a checklist of character. I could I easily put a checklist of character. Like Here's a, a, a list of things. If you're accomplishing them, then you've done something with your life, you're a respectable, noble person. And there are three of them, okay? And the, the, the first of them, and probably the most popular of them, is Surah Al-Mu'minun, the beginning passage of Surah Al-Mu'minun. It's a checklist of character. The second of them is what was recited, Surah Al-Furqan, towards the end, the 25th surah, towards the end, uh, the passage that begins, وَعِبَادُ الرَّحْمَانِ الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنًا That's the second passage. And the last of them is towards the end of Surah Al-Ma'arij. Uh, in, this, in the 70, uh, what is it? The 70th surah itself. Yeah, the 70th surah of the Quran, Surah Al Ma'arij. But there is an interesting difference between these three passages. Though they all have a list of expectations from the believer, they all have a different quality and a different flavor to them. And that's because Allah Azza wa Jal does not expect all of us to meet, you know, there's, you know, in, in academics they say you have the expectations to graduate. Here's the minimum requirements that you graduate. And then there are people that are, you know, they made, they got the B students. And you've got the honor roll, right? So you've got different ranks of students that graduate. And similarly, this test of ours in life, Allah Azza wa Jal expects high things from us, but he, it's a mercy of Allah that He doesn't expect the highest from everybody. That He actually gave us different sets of requirements so that we can work towards one. If we've accomplished that, we can work towards the next one. We accomplish that, we can work towards the next one. And so the one I'm talking to you about today, Surah Al-Ma'arij, is actually the minimum of these three. It's the, it's the bare minimum. And I wanted to start with that because a lot of times I feel like when we talk about the Qur'an and some of the descriptions of the believers in the Qur'an, those descriptions seem so intimidating to most Muslims that they hear that and they say, ah, it's probably not going to be me. That's more, more, more likely that's describing a Sahabi. But I don't think I'm ever going to get there. So it's nice to know that they were great. Radiallahu anhum ajma'in. And that's probably some of the great salihin of our past, the great righteous people of our past. But, you know, I'm, I am who I am. So it's just good to know that we were pretty good, cool at one point in our life. And I'm just going to increase my depression after hearing this talk about great people. You can't hear me properly? No, you're pointing at them? Okay. All right, something's up. I don't know. Is there any way to put the volume up? Yes. I got a, this is advanced technology technique. Okay. Is this better? I can raise my volume. I'm, I'm going to try to speak louder, inshallah. Okay. So what was I saying? Adam alayhi salam story? What was it? Something about Christians? Huh? Ah, Surah Al-Ma'arij. Very good. Thank you. Okay. So Surah Al-Ma'arij, the least of these three passages. Uh, I'll just say a brief couple of things about the other two passages, even though I won't be talking about them today. The other two passages, the most famous of them is Surah Al-Mu'minun, Surah number 23. And that begins, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ Which already sets a very high standard from the very beginning of the passage. And that is that true believers, the people of sustained, matured faith, have already attained success. So Allah is not even talking in that passage about people who will attain success. He's talking about people who have already attained it. And then when He talks about the fact that they pray, He doesn't just say, الَّذِينَ هُمْ يُصَلُّونَ He says, الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ constantly and consistently, every time they're in their prayer, they have this quality that you've heard so much about, khushu'ah. That they don't have khushu'ah once in a while, it is a constant for all of their prayers. It is a standard for them to have khushu'ah in salah. Now that eliminates pretty much the majority of the summah. <laughs> you know, so I mean, we're not in good shape when it comes to our salawat. Right, so it's a high standard already and that's why in that passage, one of the highest levels of Jannah is described at the end, الَّذِينَ يَرِثُونَ الْفِرْدَوْسِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ These people are going to inherit Al-Firdaus. Those people described in Surah Al-Mu'minun. Why? Because Jannah Al-Firdaus doesn't come cheap. 
We have to meet some high requirements to make it to Jannatul Firdaus. Allahumma adkhilna fi Jannatul Firdaus. But we have to take steps to get there. Another passage in which Allah describes people who deserve His special love and His special care and His special attention, so much so that He gives them a title that He hasn't given, given them anywhere else in the Qur'an, is the passage from Surah Al-Furqan. He says, وَعِبَادُ الرَّحْمَانِ أَلَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنًا It's the slave of Ar-Rahman. He doesn't even say, عِبَادُ الله. He says, عِبَادُ Rahman," which is an expression of His Rahmah coming close to these ibad, to the point where there's an idafa, a connection made between the two of them. And that's an expression of how much Allah loves the people he describes, describes in Surah Al-Furqan. And in Surah Al-Furqan also, tough you know, requirements are placed, even for example, الَّذِينَ يَبِيتُونَ لِرَبِّهِمْ سُجَّدًا وَقِيَامًا Those people who spend the entire night at home praying. They spend good chunks of the night praying in sajda and standing and crying to Allah and making dua to Him. Uh-oh, that eliminates a good-sized population already. So two out of those three passages have very high expectations of Muslims. Of very high expectations. So now two strikes and we're down to one. <laughs> That's Surah Al-Ma'arij. Surah Al-Ma'arij is, okay, at least meet this one. Now look at the descriptions, right? In Surah Al-Mu'minun, Allah described them as Al-Mu'minun, which is a very high wasf. It's a very high quality. So from the very beginning, Al-Mu'minun are being described. In Surah Al-Furqan, who are being described? Ibad rahman the slaves of Ar-Rahman, a title, an honor is being given. But in this passage, the description entirely is of one group of people, لِأَنَّ الْفِقْرَ تَمَامًا كُلْ هَذِهِ الْآيَاتِ All of these ayat, the entire passage, is actually the wasp, the description of one word, and that word is al-musallin. The word that's being described in this passage is al-musallin. Now what does al-musallin mean? The people who pray, simply speaking. The people who pray. Now when you say the one who's a true believer, are there higher expectations from a true believer? Does it take a lot more to be a true believer than just prayer? Yeah, you got to do a lot more to be called al-mu'min. So if somebody's going to be titled the slave of Ar-Rahman that Allah Himself takes pride in, is the only requirement salat or are there more requirements on top of that? There are more requirements. But this passage Allah says, look, basically He's telling us, I'm, I'm going to describe the people who actually pray, the people of salat. Which by doing this, Allah opened the invitation to all of us to join in this passage. SubhanAllah. Anybody who's making salat can just make some adjustments in their life and they can fall here. And when they get good at this, they can work towards Surah Al-Mu'minun and work towards Surah Al-Furqan and attain the highest levels of Jannah. May Allah include all of us in, a, in those highest levels of Jannah. What's also interesting in this passage is before Allah talks about the Musalleen, He gives us, in, there are isharat in the Qur'an like, you know, the great Ibn Ashur rahimahullah in his tafsir, At-Tahrir wa Tanweer, brilliant, brilliant tafsir of the Qur'an. You know, one of the motivations for you guys to learn the Arabic language is to read some of these great minds of the Ummah that have written just absolutely phenomenal works and, and reflections on the Qur'an. And this is one of those people. It's, it, it, knowing what Ibn Ashur rahimahullah had to say about the Qur'an is enough motivation to, for a student of knowledge to excel in their Arabic. Really it is. It's just such a jewel to, to, to learn from. Uh, but anyhow, so he comments about these ayat, or actually uh, uh, comments about uh, this particular passage that in al insana khuliqa halu'a, that the salah in this passage that's mentioned is actually not just about the akhirah, because you know we think we pray and it's going to give us benefits in the afterlife, but actually Allah is describing in this passage from his asharat indications he's giving us is that there are some amazing benefits of salat in worldly life. There's in, in this world, you'll experience some really tremendous benefits from prayer. And then he goes on to describe other things that will happen for you. So now I want to start with that. And that is, إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ خُلِقَ halua. No doubt the human being, he was created halu' The Arabic word is halu' Which means extremely inappropriately reactionary. That's how I like to translate halu' Halu' يعني له قلة الصبر He has very little patience. Very little patience. And he reacts to good things and bad things in a way that's not appropriate. That most of the time, the things that come our way, situations that we find ourselves in, our actions, that necessarily demand from us a reaction and most of the time the human being has the wrong reaction. We have the wrong reaction to most situations. Somebody says something and in your mind a thought crosses, man, I should, if I say something now, I could really put this guy down. I have an insult that just came in my head that I'm so urging, itching to say to him and that you, you know, the, the, the urge is so strong that you just go ahead and you say it. And everybody gets a laugh out of it and you're like, yes, score. You know, 
Because that impulse was there and you had to act on that impulse, that makes you a halu'ah. Halu'ah is someone who doesn't have patience over themselves when the situation arrives. Halu'ah is actually to, be, to have bad reactions to any circumstance, good or bad. It's general in nature. And Allah says the human being was created with this capacity. But before I go on, this can create a problem. Just translating it like that can create a problem in the minds of some Muslims. The human being, Allah tells us, is an honored creation of Allah. It's an honored creation of Allah. And, I, and actually in my talk about psychology the other night, about sadness and stuff, I, if you recall, I was mentioning how we don't believe the human being is a flawed creature. But if you just read the ayah, ayah just like that, the human being was created just you know, that in, in a reactionary way. That one of his things, one of his qualities is that he's very reactionary. That sounds like a flaw. But in the Arabic language, you know, bilisan in Arabi and mubin, the word halu'an grammatically would be considered a, a hal, a state. And a state is actually conditionally, it's limited. Meaning there's a difference, I'll, I'll try to make this as simple as I can folks. There's a difference between an adjective and a state. An adjective is a quality you have, like short, or tall, or fat, or skinny, or ugly, or pretty, or whatever. You have a quality, it's, you have it, you don't change it, you can't change that about yourself. But when you have a state, like angry, angry is a state. Right? Happy is a state. Does, do those states change? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, for some of you, they don't change. I know. But <laughs> like, normally, those states are supposed to change. Ahwal tatagayyar. Ahwal tatagayyar. The states are supposed to change. Now, grammatically, that's also the case. When something is a hal, it's actually not describing something permanent. So the appropriate, if you consider the grammar of the ayah, you would have to say the human being was created with the capacity to be in that state. One of the potential threats to the human personality is our, is our tendency to become reactionary if we don't watch it. That, that danger exists inside of us to become halu'ah. And then it's even muqayyad, it's restricted in the ayat إِذَا مَسَّهُ الشَّرْ jazua. إِذَا means when. In other words, the human, becomes, the human being becomes inappropriately reactionary when, so Allah didn't just say all the time, but when something happens, when bad things happen to him. إِذَا مَسَّهُ الشَّرْ Jazua. He has no patience whatsoever. He becomes cowardly. He caves in. He loses all hope. He becomes negative. He doesn't want to face reality. All of these are taken from Lisan al-Arab, like the lexicon of the Arabic language. What, what jazua means? Jaza means to, to lose hope, to become cowardly, to not, not face opposition, to become negative, to not have any patience, to become just completely irrit irritated. So you become a person, when something bad happens, a shar here doesn't mean evil necessarily, it means anything that you didn't want happening. Something happens and you're just in a bad mood immediately. You just explode and you become a different person all of a sudden. And some people you know are like that, probably, maybe even yourself, possibly, that you become a completely different person if you hear something you didn't want to hear. And people are afraid to talk to you. Because they don't know when you're going to explode. You're just, you're so, you're, you're, a mind, you're an emotional minefield. So your friends want to tell you you have an issue, but they're really scared to tell you so your friends among themselves say, hey bro, you're going to tell him? Nah bro, you know, I, you, you tell him. You tell him, because he's jazur. <laughs> he, he's going he's to blow up, he can't handle it. He can't handle it. So there are people like that, and that's not the only reaction. Al-ghadab, that's not the only, you know, raddatul amal. It's not the only reaction, but there are other reactions too. Like you tell someone something and they completely become depressed. Or you criticize someone and they, get, they lose all self-confidence. Like, oh yeah, you're right, I'm just scum. Yeah, I, I'll never do this again, forget it. Like you have this kid who's like an MSA president or something, and he made a flyer, or he put a program together, and the program, they didn't order food correctly or something, or whatever, and somebody came and said, brother, if you, if you ordered the food a couple of days ago, it would have been better. Oh yeah, I forgot, I've quit the MSA, I can't do anything. I just, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, that's jazua. Okay, you, can, you know, th this bad reaction, you overly react. You have an overly negative reaction when criticism is, waged, is, is thrown your way. Right? You don't know how to navigate it. And this is jazur. These are very, very human tendencies. This is the other reason I wanted to bring up this passage. Is that this passage begins with emotions that all of us have. And experiences that all of us have had. So it's not speaking about a very lofty, like, you know, high level human being that you can't even relate to. It's talking about you and me. I've been, I've been in that position for sure. I've been in the position where I'm criticized and I become completely depressed. Like, oh, what's the point even? 
And sometimes I've been given pretty amazing criticism. Like one of my first, I, I remember one of the first times I gave a talk, it was actually, I still remember, it was at St. John's MSA. I'm not, I'm not hating on St. John's MSA, I'm just saying. You know, I was to give, give a talk and somebody came up to me, an older came up to me, shook my hand and said, you should never speak again. <laughs> <laughs> it felt really bad. I mean, it, was, it was really bad. But, I mean, I got over it. And then I see him once in a while, and he's like, what's up? <laughs> Still talking. <laughs> but anyhow, and you have to learn to navigate criticism. So, إِذَا مَسْتَهُ شَرُّ جَزُوعَ is not just, by the way, it's not limited to criticism. It's about any, anything, any setback in life. Any setback happens in life, and you have a negative reaction, that's jazur. So first Allah says you have impulsive reactions, good or bad. And then particularly when bad things happen, you just collapse, you fall apart. And you can't deal with it. And some people have strange reactions. You know what their jaza' is? Their jaza' is they don't, they're not going to talk about it, they're going to ignore it. So their wife is telling them they have an issue, like, okay, I'll, we'll talk about this later, I'm just going to go play Assassin's Creed right now. <laughs> or I'm just going to play for four hours until you go to sleep, and then I'll, we'll pretend the problem doesn't exist. You can't, you can't face the discussion. You can't, you can't be confronted about it. Right? And every time it's brought up, you just avoid the subject. and You just go do something else. This is a form of jazr also. An inability to face the problems that are in front of you. Allah says that potential exists inside some human beings. وَإِذَا مَسَّهُ الْخَيْرُ manua. Interesting also. The two words in Arabic, there's manu'ah, which means excessively forbidding. Excessively denying. Denying others. In other words, you go out of your way to make sure nobody else gets what you got. You got something good coming your way, you want to make sure nobody gets even a piece of it. You know, you want to see an example of manure, and it's not like evil people. I'm talking about just average human beings. You have siblings, right? There's, you have siblings, and you, you know, only like there's four brothers and sisters, and one sister found four cookies in the kitchen. And she's got three other sisters, but she found four cookies in the kitchen. Now, it's easy math. She gets one, the others get one each. But what's the first tendency? Before the other sisters see you, take a bite. If you can't finish all of them, at least take a bite or lick all of them at least. <laughs> at least lick all of them. I already licked it. You know? That's not, I'm not saying that child is evil, but that's a human tendency. That's something Allah put inside the human being. You, when, you, when good comes your way, you want it all to yourself, even if you don't need all to yourself. Even if it wouldn't hurt you to share. It wouldn't hurt you. You would rather get a stomach ache than give it to somebody else. You know, and one of the favorite like candy experiments I do with my children is M&M's. Because M&M's is a lot to go around, you know. Like a, a Snickers is hard to share, you know. And I have six kids, so Twix is not going to work. So M&M's, you know, it's economical. <laughs> but then, you know, when you're pouring and you say everybody gets two, right? You, you do this tough economy, you know. So everybody gets two. <laughs> then somebody gets three and they immediately clench their fist. Right? Look, ah, I got three. You know? <laughs> and then everybody else wants three. And then somebody tries to snatch four. You know why this happens? This is actually human nature. Allah put this inside us. There's a tendency inside us to want more than our share. It's there. This is the same tendency that leads some people on Wall Street to get, give themselves huge bonuses, even if it means that 300 people are going to lose their job or their homes. It doesn't matter. Because that, that tendency, if it's not checked, if it's not put in place, can lead to high levels of corruption. Where do you think corruption comes from in government? Why do you think, you know, the, these kickbacks, and in most corrupt governments, especially in the Muslim world, what is corruption always tied to? It's not about power, it's about money. It's about money. Somebody wants more than their share. The, 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 the official, the representative, is having a kickback to himself, and he's not letting the well get built, or some infrastructure get developed. Because everything that comes goes outside of it into his pocket, you know. We have politicians in the Muslim world whose names are things like Mr. 10% or Mr. 20%, etc., etc. These are the common names among the politicians, you know. Why? Because this, this, is, this is the idea of whenever good comes to you, manua. he's preventing others from getting it. And in this ayah, already we have an, an indication that this tendency that we have is something that has to be fought. There's a, here's a reason it has to be fought. Before Allah talks about these three ayat, إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ خُلِقَ هَلُوعًا إِذَا مَسَّهُ الشَّرُّ جَزُوعًا وَإِذَا مَسَّهُ الْخَيْرُ مَنُوعًا Right before this ayah is actually the ayat of hellfire. Right before this is a commentary about people who end up in hellfire. And then Allah talks about these kinds of people. What is Allah telling us? 
these people had these tendencies and they lived according to those tendencies, they didn't fight those tendencies, they didn't curb those tendencies, and that is why they ended up in hellfire. And by the way, if you want to just summarize all three of these tendencies, somebody who's self-absorbed, right? Somebody who's selfish. Look at the description of this person on Judgment Day in the same surah. Allah Azza wa Jal says, يَوَدُّ الْمُجْرِمْ لَوْ يَفْتَدِي يَوْمَ إِذِنْ يَفْتَدِي مِنْ عَذَابِ يَوْمِ إِذِنْ بِبَنِيهِ The criminal is going to wish on that day that he can ransom his child for his own life. He's going to give up his kid so he cannot burn in hell. وَأُمِّي وَصَاحِبَتِهِ وَأَخِيهِ And his wife. It's, it's interesting, he didn't offer his wife first, he offered his child first. You would think otherwise, right? But he offered his child first. Why Allah is describing the extent of his greed? He doesn't even care about his child. What, what to mention his sahiba? And Allah didn't say, by the way, his zawja. Zawja is wife. Sahiba is the wife he was always with. He actually loved her. Zawja, you could have love, not love. It could be complicated. But a sahiba, you're always with her. Like the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa has sahaba. Sahaba, right? He doesn't just have rufaqa. He doesn't just have zumala. He doesn't just have atba'. He doesn't just have you know muti'in. He doesn't have followers. He doesn't have associates, affiliates. No, no, no. He has sahaba. Sahaba means they're always with him and they love being with him. So when the wife is called sahiba, it actually means he was in love with his wife and he always wanted to be with her and he's ready to give her up for for being saved for, from hellfire. And then wa akhi and his brother, wa fasilatihi and his entire family, extended family. He counts his cousins by name. Let him go to hell. And not just any family. You know, there's cousins you hate. You're <laughs> like, okay, Allah, this one. Take him. <laughs> but not that. The, cu- the family that protected him, that, uh, that sheltered him. He's offering them to go into the hellfire. And then eventually, Waman fil ardi jami'an, Ya Allah, you know what? I would really love to be saved from hell. If I can offer you the rest of the population of the earth, Waman fil ardi jami'an. With no exception, take everybody to hell, let me go. That's how selfish this guy is on Judgment Day. And Allah describes then, but you know, your selfishness on Judgment Day didn't just come out of nowhere. You already had selfishness in this world. You were halur, jazur, manur. You had these qualities already. And then Allah says, well then you and I are supposed to be worried because Allah didn't say kuffar have these qualities. Allah said, inna insana khuliqa halu'a. The human being has these qualities. He was created in this way. But then Allah adds, إِلَّا المصلين, With the exception of people who pray. Except, the exception is the people who pray. In other words, these qualities, what's the first remedy against them? Salat. Salat is supposed to make you less selfish, more considerate of others, more sharing, more caring, more patient, less reactionary, more calm, more, you know, more collected. It's supposed to have a psychological impact on you and me. These are the people of Salat. Allah says when, you have, when the people of Salat don't have these qualities, then the question comes, are we really making Salat? Because, I mean, we're making Salat and we still have a lot of disorders. We still have a lot of really bad reactions in life. We re- still really have really bad tempers. We have all of these tendencies among ourselves. Why? Because perhaps we haven't realized what it truly means to make Salat. إِلَّا الْمُصَلِّينَ Salat is supposed to be this calming experience where you stand in front of Allah and you're talking to Allah. And you've heard many lectures about Salah, but I'm trying to talk about Salah in the context of this passage. What Allah Azza wa is telling us here. So please try and understand the connection. You know when kids are misbehaving? When kids are acting selfish and the mother walks in? The mother walks in. What's going on here? What happens to all the kids? They freeze. They behave properly. You're right, they freeze. And they're just, they're, they're ashamed too. Sorry, mom. First they try to say, it was, it was, no, no, it was, it was. And then they say, sorry. Finally they admit. Finally they admit. When, you, when you're up to no good and you have to stand and explain yourself in front of an authority, especially the loved authority, like a parent or a teacher, it's embarrassing, isn't it? And when you come out of, if you were, if you were called into the teacher's office and the teacher spoke to you and said, didn't I give you many chances? Didn't we have this talk last week? Remember when I said, you, remember when you promised me that you won't do this again? Have you forgotten? Yeah, I remember. What do I have to do to convince you? I mean, what, am I not a good teacher to you? And you're like, yeah, you are. 
as you are walking out of that office, aren't you making a promise to yourself, I'll never let this happen again? Aren't you letting, I, this is so embarrassing, I'll never ever do this again. If you have an ounce of decency in you, then that go, standing in that office and getting that thrashing is actually therapeutic. That, they say in Arabic, Al-Itabu Yusuf in Nufus. They say, Dant Pete, you know what Dant Pete is? Like Urdu speakers know what Dant Pete is. Right? A scolding, it cleanses the soul, they say. The scolding cleanses the soul. That's why your parents yell at you so much. They want tazkiyah to nafs for you. <laughs> really, it's a spiritual thing for you. That's what they're trying to do. Like, brother, I want more iman. Get your parents to yell at you more. It'll increase your iman. <laughs> you know? But the, the, the point here I'm trying to make is when we come to salah, we're standing in front of Allah. And if we're really standing in front of Allah consciously, then you, become re you realize the kinds of attitudes you just had. Th these are not the attitudes of someone who stands in front of Allah with humility. You should not have been this reactionary. It's incredible, even the act of salah, it, it keeps you from being reactionary. You're not supposed to look around, you're not supposed to respond to people that, say, that are talking to you. You're not supposed to just, you have to block everything out. You have to learn to just be in constant recognition of Allah and not let anything else influence you. And it's actually a training for your personality that even outside of Salah, no matter what's happening, you don't forget Allah is watching and you have a certain restriction on what you can do. Salat is the ultimate restriction. Not, you can't even look around, you can't even walk around, you can't do nothing. It's the ultimate restriction. But that restriction is supposed to train you to restrict yourself outside of Salah too. That's what it's supposed to do, you know. That in, in Salat, our hearts are facing the Qibla, our hearts are facing the house of Allah, and our hearts are facing, you know, and reminding ourselves, we're standing reminding ourselves of Judgment Day, and outside, we're supposed to be in that state all the time. إِلَّا الْمُصَلِّينَ And Allah says, الَّذِينَ هُمْ عَلَى صَلَاتِهِمْ دَائِمُونَ So beautiful. Allah says, they, these people on their Salawat especially, these guys are constant. دَائِمُونَ Young brothers, please listen up. You have a habit that I know about. I don't know who told me, I, mean, I can't tell you who told me, but you have a habit. Those of you that are praying, there's a bunch of guys here that aren't praying five times. Or they wake up at 10 a.m. and then they think about praying, making up Fajr. You know, they wake up and they're like, ah, yeah, I'll make it up later or whatever. And maybe they make it up, maybe they don't make it up. And there's a bunch of guys here that only come for Jum'ah Salat. That there's those guys too. There's a bunch of guys that hang out late at night and then they're too tired to make Isha and they go just go to sleep. There's a bunch of people like that. There's a bunch of people that are watching movies until like 2 in the morning and then they're not waking up for Fajr consistently, regularly. And then they wake up and it's just time to go to school or whatever, sun's halfway up already, yeah, what's the point, oh, I missed it. That's okay, another strike, what, what can you do? Just move on with life, it's no big deal, you're missing Salat. You know? And then there are the people among you that do pray five times, Alhamdulillah. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, that's between you and Allah. But if you're praying five times, if you are praying five times, then you, then you and I also have a tendency. Man, I got time. What is it for a couple of hours more? I got time, you know? And then uh, like five minutes before Asr, oh man, okay, okay, okay. And then you do a hit and run Salat. <laughs> you hit the ground and you run a couple of times, you know, such that. That's the hit and, hit and run Salat. Like the Subhana Rabbi <laughs> like, you know? <laughs> and you do the cardiovascular and you move on, <laughs> you know? That there's, the, there's those of you, there are those of you that are just chilling, sitting there talking at the restaurant or whatever, Maghrib came in, no, no, sky still looks blue, we're okay, we're okay, we're okay. You keep putting it off, you know, there's that tendency. There's those of you that haven't prayed Isha at its normal time for a very, very long time, and today, because you were at the masjid, you were kind of forced to pray it. But otherwise, it's like 12 a.m., 1 a.m., 2 a.m., you know. There's, there's, it's a very real problem. Allah says people, who Allah describes as people who pray, are not people like this. They are people who are constant in their prayers. In other words, you, your life revolves around Salat. Salat does not revolve around your life. Everything else has to revolve around Salat. You know, you ever seen pillars in a building? You ever seen pillars in a building? Can you move the pillars? No, you have to go around them. If you want to put furniture, set something up, you cannot move the pillars. Because if you try to mess with the pillar, what happens? Entire building collapses. The five prayers are the pillars of our, of, our, of our day. You can't move around them. You can't move them around. You have to keep them where they are. And if not, then the foundation of your faith, the building of your faith is ready to collapse. You got to keep them in their place. And so the advice Allah is giving to the people or the, describing the people of real salat, first quality, they are constant with their prayer, which means they have a very set 
precise, methodical schedule for their salats. And this is a, and you've heard importance of salat lectures before. I'm sure of it. I'm just trying to be real here, guys, especially the young brothers here. I am telling you, you will, if you want, if you have any love for Islam, and you want to do something for Allah, you want to do something for this deen, and you have aspirations to learn more about this deen and serve this deen more, then let me tell you, all of your aspirations are fake and they're ingenuine until you have the urgent desire to want to pray Fajr at the masjid and Isha at the masjid. And if that is not your concern and you don't even feel bad about doing that, then you, have, you really don't have a genuine concern for Islam itself. Because if you want to serve Islam, then you have to first be re qualified to serve Islam. And yet that won't happen until your Iman is in a certain place. And then Iman will not be in its place until Salat, especially Fajr and Isha, are constants for you. You've made the time for them. And I know you can, because you make time for eight-hour role-playing video games. You make time for five hours of basketball. You make time. When you have to make time, you make time. When you have to cram for an exam, you stay up the whole night. You do. And I even argue, please listen to this carefully, I even argue the sin of missing Fajr doesn't happen in the morning. The sin of missing Fajr happens when you're staying up at late night. Because you already know you're not going to get up and you stay up anyway. You know what's happened the last thousand times. When you're up that late, you're not going to get up for Fajr. And you still choose to stay up late. You've just missed Fajr intentionally. You can't say to yourself when you wake up at 9 a.m., Oh, well, I didn't mean to. I was asleep. I couldn't help myself. No, actually, that was on purpose because you purposely, knowingly stayed up to the point where it's physically impossible for you to get up in the morning. Even if your mother's kicking you in the stomach, nothing, ma nothing makes a difference to you. You know? Now, now, and th this is very real, guys. We have to stop kidding around. We have to stop having conversations about, you know, when, is the, the, when the Dajjal comes, I'm going to try to kill him. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. I'm going to be like, I'm going to be... You know, I can't wait till the black flags are raised and the army of the Mahdi and... Yeah, dude, pray Fajr first, man. <laughs> you know? Pray Fajr first. Go to Isha Ibadat, guys. And we're living in times, subhanAllah, and New York is very blessed in many ways. It's, it's a very not blessed in many other ways, but it's very blessed in many ways. And one of those ways is, subhanAllah, you have great halaqat, steady circles, programs, seminars, classes, speakers, scholars, so many masajid. There's so much education going on in New York. It's really cool. It's great. It's not happening in much of the country like this. Not at this rate. So you're very fortunate to have that. But you know what the danger with that is? That you start glorifying learning and you start undermining worship, ibadah itself. Right? And fundamental ibadah, Fajr Isha, young guys, young men in the audience today, Fajr Isha, you have to get that together. You have to get that together. And if you care about serving this deen, if you really care about serving this deen, then you will want to make better Fajr and better Isha. And the way to do that is to start memorizing as much Quran as you can. As much as you can. I'll share something personal with you guys and the only reason I'm sharing it with you is to try to encourage you. I was trying to memorize Quran when I was in college. I did a little bit of it when I, while I was in college in New York. And then I got busy and I left it. Then I tried to memorize some more, then I left it. Then I got busy and I left it. And it's been going back and forth like that, right, for some time. And I've been putting off finishing Hifz until I went to Hajj this year, alhamdulillah. And when I came back from Hajj, I made the intention at Hajj that I'm going to do Hifz, inshallah ta'ala. But the problem is, you know, with six children, family, work, teaching, administrative work, all this other stuff piled on top of me, where am I going to make time for Hiv? How am I going to do it? I, I want to do it really badly, but I just don't have the time. And then I had to sit down and say, well, I need to make a schedule where this is going to work. So what I do for myself is I try to go, there's a, there's a big masjid in our neighborhood, there's a small masjid in our neighborhood. The small masjid is actually nobody's there, it's like four guys there for Fajr. The big one is 300 people there for Fajr. So I actually don't go to the big masjid for Fajr, because it's too social. And then you go there, you just end up chatting with people, and you get little time for your own ibadah, right? But I end up going, I go, because uh, uh, Fajr is late nowadays, so I go before Fajr, I get a half hour, 45 minutes for memorization, go, go make salat, then go take my bus to the bus stop, then come back and have breakfast with my mother, then get ready for work and show up to work at 8 o'clock. That's my schedule in the morning. That's what I do in the morning. Why? Because I, I made the intention that I, and it doesn't work every morning. Sometimes I wake up 30 minutes late and I can't get to the, you know, I get, get, get there for Salat, but I didn't get to do any memorization. But at least I have that in my schedule to the best of my ability. I'm going to try to do it. Right? And th there's one time that I have that I, can't, that I can't, nobody else needs me at that time. Everybody's asleep at home. Nobody else needs me. 
So I, I could use that time for my own benefit. And you will absolutely have to make that kind of time for yourselves. If you're really serious about advancing yourselves as slaves of Allah, it's not just about the knowledge, it's also about worship and standardizing that worship. And when that happens, you will see that Allah will put barakah in your knowledge. Allah will put blessing in your, it'll stick with you, you'll learn beneficial things, you'll be able to recall them easily, all of that will start happening for you. So anyway, الَّذِينَ هُمْ عَلَىٰ صَلَاتِهِمْ دَائِمُونَ Then the other part of this conversation, and I'll conclude inshallah and take your questions if, if there are any, because I think this is pretty straightforward and, 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 and direct. You know, the Salat is supposed to have an impact not just on our personal psyche, but it's supposed to have an impact on our ethical worldview. Now there's a difference between, I know this gets a little philosophically abstract, but I'll try to be, as, again, as clear as possible. There's a difference between observing law and observing ethics. There's a difference between law and morality. Okay? Law is that you stop at a red light. You stop at a red light. And you go at what? A green light. That's the law. But ethics is, there's, a, there's an old man crossing the street. It's already green. He's already halfway there. Or there's a quarter of the way there. And you're like, let me just go around him. What would be the ethical thing to do? Just wait. Let him go. Let him go. And then go. Now the law doesn't tell you to stop for him. But ethics does. Right? It's a moral thing. I mean, just be nice to this old man. He's trying to cross the street. Why are you going to be like that? No, well, legally I didn't do anything wrong. It's not like haram in the Sharia or anything. You know, in the Sharia of New York State traffic law. It's not. No, but actually, so there are two things. You can abide by the law and still be unethical. You can, that's what I'm trying to get across. You can abide by the law and still be what? Unethical. And that's actually possible in Islam also. Our deen has laws and our deen also has ethics. And you know what's happened? We, we emphasize the law. We emphasize the law of Islam. And sometimes we actually almost completely invalidate and overlook what? The ethics of Islam. So worship and law become more important and ethics becomes less important. And this is a serious crisis of the ummah. It's a very serious crisis. Like for example, worship is important. To give you an example, you're at Hajj. You want to touch Hijr Aswad or you want to touch the Kaaba. And who, which Muslim doesn't want to touch the Kaaba? And you're pushing and shoving and there's an old Indonesian lady and you're just elbowed her in the face and you just, you know, I've seen it. I've seen it. So you can touch the Kaaba. You know. What ibadah is that, dude? What are you going to go hold the Kaaba for? So you can ask Allah to forgive you for elbowing the lady in the face? <laughs> Why did you go up there? It's, it's, it's really, it's like a, it's a, it's a phenomenon. And even the security guard, you know the guy that's hang, hanging off the ledge at the haram? Even that guy gets so tired of it at one point. It's awesome. That guy, one time it was like a free-for-all. Everybody's like, ah, trying to get the And he's hanging off. And he's supposed to be like, khallu, khallu, khallu. Leave it. Come on. Come on. Move it. Harrik, harrik, ya haj. Harrik. Move it, move it. He gets so tired of it. He's just on his phone like, yeah, what's up? You know, it's going crazy. Yeah, so I don't even care no more. <laughs> it was awesome. He was like, yeah, I'm... These guys are crazy. I'm just going to let them kill themselves. Okay. Yet another janazah after salat. <laughs> you, know, it's just, uh, it's like, you know what the problem there is, is you have, the, you have this really motivated sense of worship, but you have no what? No ethics. Are you, you're a hujaj. And you don't know the ethics of getting in a line to order food at a restaurant. You know, to be courteous to one another. It, it, it's, it's not there, you know. So the, 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 the ethics problem is a big one. And the, the reason I'm bringing it up is that Salat, one of its great results, side effects, if you will, its side effects is that it makes you an ethical person. Real Salat is supposed to make you ethical. How do we know that? Because when Allah Azza wa describes the people of Salat and they're constant in the Salat, what's the first things He mentions? وَالَّذِينَ فِي أَمْوَالِهِمْ حَقٌّ مَعْلُومٌ لِلسَّائِلِ وَالْمَحْرُومِ and in their money, those are the people who in their money, there's a known right. They know about the right. It is well known to them that this money is actually not there. It is for the one who asks and the one who's been deprived. It's not even talking about zakat yet. It's just saying, you have money, you have enough to take care of yourself, you see somebody in need, and you don't even think you're helping them out. You think of it as, Allah gave this to me so that I can give it to them. It's a haqqun ma'loom for them. It's a known right to me. I deep down inside know this isn't even my money, it's theirs. I deep down inside know 
that I shouldn't order this much food, I should order this much food. You know? This this lisa'ili wal mahroom. They, they're constantly thinking about giving to others. That's an ethical person, already concerned about other people. Salat is for yourself. Salat is for yourself. But if you really make salat, you start caring about others. Allah softens your heart, not just towards Him, but towards the rest of humanity too. It's one of the beautiful side effects of real salat. So when you have people, when you find yourself making salat and you're still mean, and you don't spend a penny on people who need it, your family members especially, your khala for example, the khala's rights are important. You know who khala is, right? Your mother's sister. Al khala tu fi halatil um, the Prophet says, sallallahu alayhi wa The khala is in the state of the mother. She has the same status as the mother. You haven't even called your khala, man. And she needs money and she's a, she's a widower and she's you know, struggling financially. She can't get her daughters married. You're supposed to take care of her. You're supposed to help her as much as you can. Taking care of family. This is haqqul ma'loom, the sa'ili wal mahroom. And then Allah goes on, وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ يُصَدِّقُونَ بِيَوْمِ الدِّينَ وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ مِنْ عَذَابِ رَبِّهِمْ مُشْفِقُونَ إِنَّ عَذَابَ رَبِّهِمْ غَيْرُ مَأْمُونَ Three ayat. Three ayat about punishment. Number one, those who confirm the day of judgment. They truly believe and confirm that the day of judgment will come. And what this means actually is, wow, if you consider the wow at of bayan, what this means is by being constant in their prayer and by giving other people their rights from their monies, they prove that they truly believe in Judgment Day. That to Allah is proof that you believe in Judgment Day. And that to Allah proves that you are مِنْ عَذَابِ رَبِّهِمْ مُشْفِقُونَ يعني أَشْفَقْتُ مِنْ عَذَابِ الله. You are terrified of the punishment of Allah. You're terrified that Allah will hold you on the other side. How come you didn't pray? And if you prayed, how come your prayer didn't have any effect on you? Why were you of those kinds of people? وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ مِنْ عَذَابِ رَبِّهِمْ مُشْفِقُونَ إِنَّا عَذَابَ رَبِّهِمْ غَيْرُ مَأْمُونَ The punishment of their master, nobody can be safe from it. It's not something you can have aman from. غَيْرُ مَأْمُونَ There's no safety from it. There's no escape from it. What this, the beautiful like, uh, result of these ayat, the ishara in these ayat, is a person becomes, they're not, possible, they're not possibly self-righteous. That's the other danger in praying regularly and helping other people. You start thinking, man, I used to be pretty bad, but alhamdulillah, now I am righteous. I am good now. Alhamdulillah, Allah gave me a lot of taqwa now, mashallah. You know? If you felt like you already have taqwa, then you shouldn't be that scared of hellfire anymore. But these people aren't. They're, they're like, man, man, I'm making salat, but I hope it's good enough. I'm making wudu, I hope it's good enough. I'm trying to help people, I hope Allah accepts that. They're not sure of themselves still. They walk that line between hope and fear, so they, they, they remain afraid of the akhirah. And then Allah talks about the big one, and that's the one I really want to end, end this conversation with, even though there's, there's more to go. But Allah makes such a big deal out of this subject, that again, just like there were three ayat about Judgment Day, now there are, وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِفُرُوجِهِمْ حَافِلُونَ إِلَّا عَلَىٰ أَزْوَاجِهِمْ أَوْ مَا مَلَكَتْ أَيْمَانُهُمْ فَإِنَّهُمْ غَيْرُ مَلُومِينَ فَمَنْ إِبْتَغَى وَرَاءَ ذَلِكَ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمْ الْعَادُونَ Three ayat about the same subject again. The only other subject that got three ayat was what? In this list. What's the only other subject that got three ayat? Judgment day. Judgment day and punishment. This is the next subject that gets three ayat. And you know what the subject is? Shamelessness. People who guard their privates. We live in the ultimately shameless world today. The world in which streaming videos off of any website are mo available on your mobile device. The age in which the pornography industry is a multi-trillion dollar industry. The point of which, the agenda of which to, is to make sure every one of you is a consumer of filth in one way or another. That every man, woman and child is exposed to this stuff and they're hoping you are so you become addicted to it so you become yet another consumer. This is, this, is the, this is the gift of pornography to society. It's creating people, turning people into animals and perverts. And some of you unfortunately have that addiction. And you're watching this stuff online. And you're watching it and saving it on your apps and your mobile devices. And you don't feel bad about it anymore. You've justified it to yourself. And you feel bad about it once in a while, but you go back to it. And as a res you think, oh, well, I'm not, at least I'm not hurting anybody. At least I'm not doing it to anybody else. I'm just watching this stuff. It's okay. But you know what's happening to you? Inside your soul is being just gutted. You have no soul left inside of you. So your prayers are empty and you can't even shed a tear in your salat because your heart is so devoid of the fear of Allah because of the filth you've been watching all this time. It's turned you from a human being into an animal. 
So you can't even look, you, a woman passes by and you, look, you, you see a piece of flesh walking by. You don't see a human being walking by that deserves respect. You check everybody out and everything out. You're, you're constantly gawking and staring. You, can, you have a hard time putting your eyes down. When you're on the subway, when you're on campus, when you're at work, you're walking down the street, you know, you just can't help. You see a billboard, you look at you take a second look, you see a third look. You don't miss any opportunity to just to, to, to violate your soul with your eyes. You're addicted completely. And then you say, brother, how do I get khushu'ah and salat? What world are you living in? What world are you living in? Ayyuhal ikhwa, my brothers, specifically my brothers. And I know some sisters have this issue too. It's, not a, it's a sad reality. This is a war. This is a war. This is more dangerous than any military war. This is the war that's destroying our souls. It's making its way into our homes. It's making its way, you know, if I, I want to protect my children from this stuff as much as possible. But when my child goes to school, and it doesn't matter if it's Islamic school, there's a very high statistical likelihood that someone, a friend, uh, with their iPod, with their mobile device, will say, hey, look at this. It's a, it's a very realistic you know, a, a, a thing nowadays. It's not far-fetched. And so I have to prepare my children for the filthy world that they're, they're going to be brought up in. And there's no escape from this stuff anymore. There isn't. It's everywhere. It is everywhere. You have Islamic lectures followed up by, you know those YouTube puts those follow-up clips? And something will be filthy. Something will have to be filthy. And I don't think that's by accident. I'm not much of a conspiracy theorist, but I'm, I don't think that stuff is an accident. And what happens to you guys is you watch a video, you see something filthy, you click it, you click something else, you click something else, and you end up watching disgusting things. That's what happens to you. Especially when it comes to their privates, they guard them. They guard their shame. Brother, what's the solution? Should I get married? Like the guy who asked the other day, was, how can I get married right now? You know? No, guys, the solution is not marriage. Because if you're a pervert, then you're going to be a pervert after marriage too. If you have no shame now, you will have no shame after marriage. Honestly. You, th you think marriage is going to end your problems? No. Your problem isn't marriage. Your problem is spiritual in nature. Your problem is psychological in nature. You need help. You need to stop this. You need to stop hurting yourself like this. You will have nothing. There will be nothing left inside you. I just had an email from a teenager who's addicted to pornography. An anonymous email. 14, 15 year old teenager. Says, I want to kill myself. I can't stop. I've been watching it since I was 11. My parents don't know. I read this stuff and I cry because he's not one. There's millions of Muslim kids like this. Millions. Millions of them. We have to help these people. We have to do whatever we can. And it, we don't have the trillions of dollars of advertising to counter that. We don't. And it's, there's, it's not realistic for me to say Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, every, internet, it's all haram. It's not realistic because it's a reality. It's, it's as common as oxygen now. The only thing we can do is have a mature conversation about this and teach our youth to deal with this and navigate this and not fall into it. The elders that are here, stop watching Indian movies, man. Why are you sitting in a lecture talking about Salat and the importance of Salat and you don't guard your shame? Mother and daughter and you know, uh, husband and wife and sister sitting together watching whatever? God, come on, stop. وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِفُرُوجِهِمْ حَافِظُونَ they guard their privates. But guarding your privates doesn't mean you don't commit zina. It means everything that leads to the temptation. Everything that leads to it. They watch it. They guard it. They know it's under attack. They know that their shame is under attack. They realize that their weakness is their, their, their urges. Those urges that Allah put inside of us. That are so strong. Allah put them there for a reason. He did. And every one of you have them. You don't have to, like, I don't have to have a dalil for you to have them. I know. The guys that are here. You all suffer that challenge every single day of your life, especially in a city like this one. At least in Texas, we're a little more conservative. Not that much more, but a little more, you know? At least in some towns, they don't allow for filthy billboards and things like that. They actually don't even allow the billboards, you know? But that's changing soon because, you know, capitalism wins in the end, right? But you guys are living in this city where you're exposed to everything and anything. Everything and anything. And you have to really go out of your way to guard yourself. This passage is not about high goals. This is about the bare minimum. I told you that, right? This is the bare minimum, folks. The bare minimum is we guard ourselves from shamelessness. 
we wage a war within ourselves against that tendency. And I know some of you have tried to quit before and you go back. And you've tried to quit before and you go back again. And you go back again and you keep falling into that trap. I know some of you have done that. You know, and you're struggling with it. But don't give up on yourself. Don't give up on yourself. And whatever it takes, if you, just don't be alone. Don't be by yourself. Be with good friends. Be outside. Do, study somewhere else. Go to the library and study. Go somewhere where other people are around. Because you're, when you're by yourself, shaitan gets you. And if the fear of Allah isn't enough for you, at least the fear of other people will work for you. At least something's better than nothing. You know? For those, of, I mean, I've said this in other talks before, for the parents here, if you have a computer in the house, please don't make it a laptop. Have a desktop in the house with a really big monitor. Get the biggest monitor you can find. <laughs> Honest to God. And make sure your, 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 your uh, computer is in the kitchen or in the dining room. Don't put it in the living room. Don't put it in the kids' room. Don't put it in your bedroom. Put it in the dining room, facing the public. <laughs> you want to do homework, do it over there. Though you can't move the monitor this way or that way. It's facing everybody. That's how you should have it. You know? This stuff, we have, we have to take these precautions. Don't give your 11-year-old a smartphone. What were you thinking? That's not very smart. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Don't give, your, don't give them a smartphone. Why am I seeing kids in Islamic school, fifth graders, with iPhones? iPhone 5s. I don't have an iPhone 5. Why do you have an iPhone 5? With 4G, you know how dangerous that stuff is? You know? وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِفُرُوجِهِمْ حَافِظُونَ إِلَّا عَلَىٰ أَزْوَاجِهِمْ Except upon their spouses. أَوْمَا مَلَكَ تَيْمَانُهُمْ فَإِنَّهُمْ غَيْرُ مَلُمِينَ Or what their right hands possess, then they're not to be blamed. Allah says we have these urges and we can execute those urges, we can release those urges, but to the halal spouse, to the spouse, our, our spouses. But outside of that, we can't. And by the way, when people get addicted to this sort of thing, and they get, they get accustomed to it, or they get over and overly exposed to it, they have miserable marriages. Their marriages start falling apart. They have this virtual idea of what pleasure means, and they don't find pleasure in their spouse anymore. And there's great fitna that comes into the family. It destroys homes. Muslim homes. That's, that's what's happening in our world today. Allah talks about the people who make salah and He says, I'm describing the people who make salah because this is the mawsuf, al musallin then al ladina all the al ladinas all the asma mawsulah here are the wasp, the sifa of it, which means the people of salah are the people who protect their shame, are the people who fear judgment day, are the people who, you know, they, they uh, um, are constant in their prayers. These are the people. The people who, are, who pursue anything beyond that, then they are the ones engaged in aggression. This is an act of aggression. You know when adu is mentioned, or adi, adin from adu, from ada yadu. Right? Al adun. Al adawa in Arabic means animosity. Allah says, whoever pursues the, their urges to be fulfilled outside of the halal, outside of the marriage, whoever pursues that, then they are engaged in an act of aggression. The question is, aggression against who? Because when you say enemy, then you have to say enemy of who? If they've become an enemy, who have you become an enemy to? Allah didn't mention a maf'ul bihi, no jar majroor, nothing related to it. You know what that means? They are an enemy to themselves, their family. They become an enemy even to Allah's teaching. You know? They, 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 these are the kinds of people. The most important asset you and I have is our hearts. And this shamelessness destroys the hearts. <clears throat> it destroys it. The most, the most precious thing you and I have to preserve is our iman. And this, this, these filthy images is destroying your iman. They're tearing your iman apart. Don't let it happen to you. Do not let it happen to you. And I, I can only talk about this. I can't stop you from doing anything. And nobody else can. You will have to police yourself. You will have to control yourself. You'll have to make the decision, is my iman important enough? Is my salat important enough? You know? Or should I just carry on and pretend? You know what, what I told you about jazur, right? When you come across evil, you just don't want to deal with it. You just ignore it. You just, and that, there's a lot of people like that. They hear this stuff and they don't deal with it. They just ignore it. And you're jazur. Then you're not from the musallim. Illa al-musallim. If you don't, don't be from the, from the people of jazur, from, from the jazurin. Don't be from them. The people who just leave it. They don't even deal with their problem. They run from it. And they cave in every time. And they're reactionary. And that's the beautiful thing about the beginning of this passage. Halu'a, reactionary. Usually we react to temptation. 
You react to an image and it leads you to a site, which leads you to something else, which leads you to something else. You're constantly reacting to things. You're supposed to learn to have the right reaction, and the right reaction comes when we become people of Salat. SubhanAllah. And then, finally, وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِأَمَانَاتِهِمْ وَعَهْدِهِمْ رَعُونَ Again, ethical stuff. Those people who, when it comes to their promises and the trust that they have been entrusted with, they keep watch over them like a shepherd keeps watch over its sheep. Ethics, guys. If you've been given a job, fulfill your job. If you've been given a contract, fulfill your contract. If you're a techie and you can build them for 500 hours, but you could have finished the project in 300 hours, then finish it in 300 hours, because those 200 hours, you're eating fire. Don't consume fire in your belly. Don't do that. You fulfill your amana. You fulfill your amana. And you could say, legally, I'm okay, but you're ethically bad. This passage is about ethics. This passage is about making us moral people, responsible people. When it comes to our dealings with each other, don't allow for, for, for one another to, you know, to get away with things. You know, I, but back in the day, we used to have a moral dilemma. I don't even know if it exists anymore. Back in the day, we used to have in the MSA, our MSAs, especially in the City University of New York, you know, Baruch College, Queens College, all these schools, they have limited budgets, limited MSA budgets, right? You get like, we used to get back in the day like 1,600 bucks a semester to do whatever we could, which was actually, I thought it was a lot. You know, we could cater food and this and that, but we used to go get Chicken Guy. Remember Chicken Guy? You guys know Chicken Guy. We used to go, but the problem with Chicken Guy is he doesn't exactly have a receipt. You know, he could write his signature on a plate for you or something, but <laughs> he doesn't have a legitimate receipt. Well, what's the problem with receipts? If you don't have a receipt, what does the school not do? They don't, they don't reimburse you. You know, so the MSA is having a meeting, hey, we should make up receipts for Chicken Guy to, to get reimbursed. And we should actually put more than he charged us so we can use the extra money to buy Islamic books for the MSA library. Huh? What? This is, uh, you're going to buy Islamic books with haram money? And you're going to feed people, uh, get, get uh, reimbursements after engaging in lies? You know? It's not, forget haram. This is just purely unethical. It's clearly wrong. I'm not passing a fatwa of haram. That, you're going the legal route. I'm saying this is immoral, unethical, and the Muslims, before we even knew about the law, we were a people of high ethics and morality. We're a people of very high ethics and very high morality. You know, this surah is Makki. It's Makki surah. And Makkan Quran, not but Sharia has been revealed. I mean, there's Salah, some form of Salah, eventually the five prayers. Salah is there. Dietary restrictions, for the most part, are not there. Clothing restrictions are not there. Alcohol is not haram yet. Riba has only been referred to once in Surah al rum Not explicitly talked about. You know, how do, how do the Muslims look different from everybody else? Ethics. They're moral people. They're not unfair people. And you know, when we think of haya for sisters, when we think of haya, what do we think of? The hijab, right? When people talk about shame for sisters, they say she should wear the hijab, she should wear the jilbab. You know, hijab was revealed 16 years after the risala began. 16 years after the message began, hijab was revealed. Jilbab was revealed. But Allah was talking about shame for all those 16 years. Because shame is much more than just hijab and jilbab. Hijab and jilbab is from the sharia. But the ethics of shame is something else. It's something bigger. It's always been there. This is the keeping of the promises. It's not a shari'i thing before. It's a, it's a moral thing. How can you stand before Allah and, say, and, and pr prove to Allah that you are truthful? And say to Allah you want His guidance. And w try to fulfill the promise to Allah who you can't even see. And you're cheating people who you do see. How is that? وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِأَمَانَاتِهِمْ وَعَهْدِهِمْ رَعُونَ وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ بِشَهَادَاتِهِمْ قَائِمُونَ And they, do, they, they, they stand by their testimonies, these people. They testify to the truth. They're not afraid to speak out. Guys, all of this is the checklist at the individual level and at the level of community. There are bad things happening in our communities and we don't speak out about it. There are bad things happening in your family and you don't speak up because you're afraid of somebody getting mad or upset. If something wrong is happening, you have to stand by the truth. Because, the, yeah, if, yeah, it's like if you see something, say something. You're right. I have big ears, alhamdulillah. It's kind of like if you see something, say something. But if wrong things are happening, you have to speak out. 
You know, you, have, you don't have to worry about people's feelings getting hurt because the truth always hurts. And if the prophets were worried about feelings getting hurt, alayhim salatu was salam, you wouldn't get the message. Because I mean, the message of Islam, when it came, it hurt a lot of people's feelings. A lot of people's feelings. A lot of people cried because of Islam. Not because they loved it, because they hated it. You know? A lot of families cried about their sons becoming Muslims. Truth hurts. It does. It's not a reason not to stand by it. Allah is telling us, when you stand before me, I will give you the courage to stand for the truth. You stand before me in salat, I will teach you to stand in front of, you know, even the worst you know, criminals and oppressors and speak the truth. And then finally, and at the end of this passage, وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ عَلَىٰ صَلَاتِهِمْ يُحَافِظُونَ And those who, especially when it comes to their prayers, they, wa- they watch over them, they guard them. When do you guard something, folks? No, not just when it's precious. It's precious, true. What else? When it's under attack. Something needs to be guarded when something is in danger. If it's not in danger, you don't need to guard it. Allah is teaching us your salat is in danger. Your salat is in danger. The passage began with salat and the passage is ending in salat. The passage began, they are constant in their prayers. The passage ends, they guard their prayers. Why does it begin and end with salat? Because Allah is teaching us everything in between is actually salat itself. The entire subject was salat itself. All of what we talked about is actually description of the people who pray. Of course they would guard their prayer by making sure they do all of these things fulfill their promises, stand by the right testimony, guard their shame, make sure they're not people of shamelessness, remembering the day of judgment, being not, not becoming self-righteous, these are the people of salat, that's the bare minimum. Ulaika fi jannatim mukramun. Those are the people, they're going to be in jannat, and they're going to be honored. Mukramun, beautiful word, I'll describe this one word for you, and I'll conclude, inshallah ta'ala. First of all, Allah says, ulaika. Ulaika, they say in Arabic, is ismul ishara lil ba'id. It's the distant. It's the distant pointer in the Arabic language. And the distant pointer is used rhetorically to say, these people are way up there. They're very high status. You better start climbing. Because if they were very attainable for you, Allah would have said, ha ulai. But because they are, they've reached even, even the minimum. This is the least passage, right? But even they are honored so much that they're honored with the word ulaika. And they are not just given one jannah. They are given jannat. Ula'ika fi jannatin. They are in multitudes of gardens. They don't get one jannat, they get multiple jannat. And then the most beautiful word in all of this, mukramun. They are constantly honored. Mukramun. Al-ikram in Arabic means to honor somebody. Mukram is someone being honored. Now the question is if I say my teacher was honored, or that man was honored, what question arises in the mind when you say someone was honored? Who honored him? Was he honored at the graduation ceremony? Was he honored by his employer? Was he honored by the president? Who was he honored by? Allah says these people will constantly be honored. Be honored by the angels, be honored by the the other members of Jannah, be honored by the prophets that came before them and are congratulating them and they're giving them honor. Be honored by Allah Azza wa Jal Himself. Everywhere they go, they get honored, they get respected, they get treated with, with special treatment. And this is one of the great gifts of Jannah. This is the great gifts of Jannah. That Allah Azza wa is telling us through Salat, if you really become a person of Salat, then you will receive the ultimate honor. We are honored to pray. So we can earn that final honor with Allah Azza wa The point I wanted to make in this talk with you is that Salat is actually, a, it's suppo- in the Qur'an's view, in the Qur'an's view, and Surah Al-Ma'arij is a testimony to this, the Salat is supposed to be a transformation of my personality. It's supposed to be a different, it's supposed to turn me into a person that deals with people differently. I become honest in my dealings, watchful with my eyes, respectful of other, you know, others. I don't, I don't, uh, uh, you know, uh, I don't say useless things. It makes, it, my worldview changes because of Salat itself. That's why we need Salat to be such an important institution in our, in our deen. And there is a barakah, and I'm almost done here, there is a barakah, a special barakah, especially for young men here, to make Salat, Fajr and Isha at the Masjid Alhamdulillah, Thumma Alhamdulillah in New York City, in Queens, Brooklyn, the Bronx, Staten Island, there is no shortage of Masajid. Every corner has some basement somewhere where you can go make Salat, everywhere. Some of you live in apartment buildings and they have an apartment just dedicated for Salat and the landlord doesn't know about it, nobody has to know, it's okay. You know, 
That's going on too. Join Salat and Jama'ah. It'll help you. It'll, it'll really, really help you. That's really the message I want to give you guys today, inshaAllah ta'ala. If you can, memorize these ayat from Surah Al-Ma'arij. It's a beautiful, beautiful surah, beginning to end. And study its tafsir. If you can, I believe Shaykh uh, Abdul Nasir in our podcast page has already done a tafsir of the surah, a full tafsir of the surah. So you can download that, inshaAllah ta'ala. You guys doing okay with attention span? Can I take five minutes of your time and just talk to you about something? Inshallah ta'ala. Just, it's five minutes. It's not on this topic. Then, then I'll open it up to questions. I know it's getting really hot in here too. So you must be uh, not doing too well. But anyway, so uh, what I want to talk to you guys about is uh, 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 something personal about myself and about the institution that I represent, Bayina, and some plans that I have. And I'm, I'm doing any major public forum I get, I'm sharing uh, these plans with you guys. Alhamdulillah, after Hajj, I felt I was telling some close friends here too that after Hajj, I felt like I got a lot of clarity after coming back from Hajj. And I realized that you know, every Muslim is supposed to think about, really deeply think about how they can make themselves a better Muslim, number one, and really deeply think about how are they going to serve Allah's deen. Now specifically, not generally, very specifically, how are they going to serve Allah's deen. And I, I started re-asking myself those questions, like how will I become a better Muslim? And what I in particular can do, and my institution can do, and my colleagues and friends and peers and teachers can do to serve deen in a substantial way. So I've, uh, after some, some, a great deal of discussion and back and forth, I've, what I think I've stumbled upon is something truly revolutionary. I'm really personally excited about it. So I want to share my excitement with you about this project that I'm involved with. Um, and inshallah ta'ala, you'll share some of these sentiments. I, I'll, I, and this will take me a little bit to explain and I hope you guys can keep up with what I'm saying. Basically, I've come to the conclusion that the, the, the Muslim Ummah today is in a great is facing a great opportunity with the advent of the internet, especially you know multimedia being available online, that we can actually bring books to life. And knowledge that was sitting in books and libraries can now be brought out and made into a YouTube video, for example. Right? So we, we have this tremendous opportunity where somebody gives a khutbah on the other side of the world, and if it was something of value, it gets viral and everybody sees it you know, across the world. So when I went to England recently, I met Muslims from Singapore and like Indonesia and Malaysia that have been following our podcast, subhanAllah. And you know, our, our, the tafsir podcasts, uh, which aren't even high quality recordings, subhanAllah, they're, they're being downloaded at two terabytes a day. We had to actually switch to an enterprise server because our server crashed. That many people were downloading them worldwide, right? So it made me realize I've been traveling a lot like in my life for Bayina and, and doing seminars and courses and things like that. But I realized something that you know, I feel I can best contribute Myself and my students and even my teachers, we can best contribute by creating resources for the ummah that anybody can access. And the best of my efforts should actually go into studying and teaching and not so much traveling. And teaching and getting it recorded and making it available. And not just random lectures, but entire subjects, like thoroughly studied. So they become like a living library, right? A video library of Quran studies and a video library of Arabic studies as just the beginning. That's what I'm interested in doing. So for me, Quran studies happens in three, in three levels. What the level one is somebody should actually at least go through the entire Quran in translation with brief explanation. They should at least know what's going on in the Quran from one end to the other at a, at a basic level explained in easy language. Alhamdulillah, that series I finished. I finished it last year with my students and I recorded it. So the entire Quran in translation, Alhamdulillah, is now done. The second was to do actually an in-depth study of a handful of surahs every year. And when I, mean, when I say in-depth, I really, really mean in-depth. It takes me maybe four months to do a, a surah that's one page long, or one and a half pages long. Four months to study for it and present it. It's a, it's a lot, a lot of work. And actually, I can't even study for it myself. I have to have a team of graduates from our program dedicated to specific areas of study, and then compile all those notes together, and then teach those courses. Because I want also not only a basic education of the Quran to be available to Muslims, but a deep, understanding of the Quran also to be available to Muslims and I'm dedicating myself to that as well. The other thing I'm interested in doing along with uh, uh, Quran is the Arabic language. I'm interested in making the Arabic education global. Like any Muslim who understands English at least can learn Arabic at a very high level sitting at home. That's what I'm interested in putting, up, putting together. right? And I've put some things together for a start for, some of you know about that, as I teach my daughter, I teach my 10-year-old about 15 minutes of Arabic a day. Right? And I record those sessions in our, our home studio. 
And it's supposed to be 20 units of Arabic, and right now we're in the middle of unit 3. We've done about 60, 70 halaqat so far. We're about at unit 3. And inshallah ta'ala, she's making great progress, and, and there's about 4,000 people online that are following her along with that, those studies. So as I teach her, I'm teaching the rest of you know, whoever wants to learn. And by the 20th unit, inshallah ta'ala, sa'atahaddath ilayha bil Arabiya. I'm going to talk to her in Arabic. Wahiya satujibuni inshallah ta'ala bil Arabiya kadalik. She's going to answer me in Arabic. We're just going to talk about Quran in Arabic. It's going to be awesome. Inshallah ta'ala. And, and the people that are following along will get us. They'll get us. They'll understand us. That's the point I want to reach. And then what I want to do is some of, how many people here are familiar with the dream program? Okay, quite a few of you, alhamdulillah. The full time Arabic studies program in Dallas, that's nine months long. By the way, in Dallas, people don't wear cowboy hats and don't have straws in their mouth. I know you're in New York and you're on top of the civilized world. Obviously, you're in Jamaica, Queens. So what, what higher civilization is there? But anyway, uh, you know. <laughs> and you understand everybody else must be primitive out in the boonies. Yes, I do not live in a barn. I do not. I do not own a banjo yet. Uh, you know. But I, I, I will tell you, so the nine month program, I'm, I'm doing it and I'll probably do it for another two years at least, inshallah ta'ala. But I'm actually hoping to get it professionally recorded in a way that can help other people learn the same material, at least the Quranic Arabic portion. So by the end of next year, by, the, by not this summer, by next summer, the entire dream curriculum will also have been recorded and posted, inshallah ta'ala. But I'm, I'm interested in not just myself, but actually taking scholars, teachers, specialists in any field. Like, you know, for example, the Nurani Qaeda, the, the Alif Bata. I want to find the best teacher for the Nurani Qaeda and get him to teach the thing on camera so everyone in the world has access to the best Alif Bata teacher ever on video. I want to take the best teacher of the Al Fiyah of Imam Malik, the best teacher of the Ajr Rumiya, the best teacher of elementary modern standard Arabic, the textbook by Cambridge University, the best teachers for every Arabic curriculum out there, I want to taught and post it. Every book, like the Medina books, or the, you know, the, the Cambridge books, or the Georgetown books, or the, well, you know, the, the, the Ar-Riyad, the Al-Sa'ud curriculum, or Al-Arabiya bayna yadayk, or whatever, whatever curriculums out there, Al-Nahw al-Wadih, you know, the grammar curricula, Arbika Mu'allim, Mu'allim wal insha you name it. If there's an Arabic curriculum out there, I want it taught and posted by the best teachers I can find, inshallah ta'ala. So this becomes not just a library of knowledge, but a library of teaching. Now how cool would that be, because then you know what will happen? All over the world, inshallah ta'ala, the homework for people will be, like in school, Islamic schools, the homework will be to watch the video. The homework will be to watch the video, and in school they'll just do the application. They'll do the exercises. So they got the best lecture they could have gotten on the subject, and now they're just applying themselves and applying themselves, inshallah ta'ala. I think it's a revolutionary model. And I'm hoping to actually gather all of that talent and put it in one place. So it becomes a one-place solution for Arabic studies, Quran studies, and eventually also, inshallah ta'ala, Islamic studies. And I'm really excited to have uh, Shaykh uh, Umar Suleiman on board, and he's starting to work towards the Islamic studies side uh, with me, with thematic tafsir and also with history. Because I actually want to eventually open up an entire Muslim history channel. So we have entire history programs on the history of Andalus, the history of the indo pakistan subcontinent, and the history of Islam there, the history of, you know, uh, uh, the Kaaba, the history of the Prophet sallallahu all, all aspects of Muslim history, like a, a one-stop resource, which I personally think can absolutely revolutionize how Islam is taught anywhere in the world. I really think it has that potential. So um, that resource for now, it's already launched. It's called Bayina TV. It's at Bayina.tv. I announced that yesterday. But I didn't share the, the larger vision for it. I'm actually, hopefully, inshallah ta'ala, at the end of, at this summer, I'm hoping to travel to Turkey and also to Malaysia to meet with faculty at the Islamic universities there and hope to start some collaborations with them. Alhamdulillah, I'm already talking to some instructors and ulama in England and other places that are willing to contribute some, some very specific things for me to build this very, very large library. The eventual goal of this, inshallah ta'ala, is not just to make these teaching resources available, but then I'm going to take, I'm, I'm going to take my institution where I teach Arabic full time. Instead of creating students, I'll turn the, t the institution into something else. I'll take, I'll turn it into the production of teachers. So I'll, I'll take people who already know some, some degree of Arabic and they've done some stuff online through our resources or others and bring them on board and make them trained teachers so they can go back to their own communities and become teachers for those communities. And I hope to do that actually for Muslims all over the world. I want to take students from Bangladesh and Turkey and Malaysia and Pakistan and India and like Somalia and have them learn this stuff as best they can 
and go back home and teach it in the local language. And I don't just want anybody. I want young men and young women that already have a bachelor's, hopefully a master's degree in a professional field, that are, that are intelligent in, in, the, in the professional sense of the word, and now they get proficient in the religious sense of the word, and then they go back and teach. Because that is a segment of society in the Muslim world, everybody thinks they're not religious. Like if you're educated and you're, you're you know, professional, then you're obviously not going to be interested in religion. Right? So when religion starts coming to society from young men and women, the women start doing their own halaqat and teaching, and the men start teaching their halaqat, and these, these young charismatic brothers and sisters, inshallah ta'ala, the dynamic even of the Muslim world can change. We can bring a new culture to the, the, the ummah. We're, we're sitting at that opportunity. So I'm really, really excited about that, inshallah ta'ala. I'd like you to check that out at bayina.tv. Uh, and at this point, inshallah, I'll open it up for any questions you might have, which probably you do not. So I want to talk to you guys about why, uh, this actually relates to why I moved to Texas. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I mean, I've lived in New York most of my adult life. And um, alhamdulillah, because of Bain, I had to travel. I, I saw maybe about 150 Muslim communities across America. And um, got to check them out and had the freedom, alhamdulillah, thumma alhamdulillah, to move to whichever community I chose. Um, but why even move to begin with? You're in New York City, right? Uh, actually, why? That's why you move, because you're in New York City. Uh, so <laughs> but I actually personally wanted to move because I, I had children. And I just didn't think it, it was, it was going to be really challenging. First of all, because of the expenses. It's a very expensive city to live in, one of the most expensive in the world. But also even, like, environmentally, it's a very tough place to raise children. Uh, it's not easy to raise children in New York City. And I'm not saying it's impossible, it's just a lot more challenging. And given my lifestyle and me having to travel and things like that, I needed a place where the children, the environment around them was a lot more uh, easier and smoother for them. And so I found that in, Dal in the Dallas community. I'll tell you the big difference between New York and Dallas as far as Muslims are concerned. The big difference is the masjid. The big difference is the masjid. The masjid in Dallas is a place for the family. The masjid in Dallas is where men, women, children all have ample space, ample opportunity, ample educational programs, ample social environments, that everybody, everybody's happy. And they're packed. The masajid are packed with men, women, and children. And they, you know, they, they build facilities because they can afford to do so in a way that women have just an enormous amount of space to themselves. And they do all kinds of social activities, and the men have enormous space, and the kids have a lot of like playing space and you know uh, sports activities and things like that. And it's just it's really wonderful to see the mushad come to life every night. It's really beautiful to see that. So that's one of the great like differences. And I personally felt I want to raise my children, and I want to make the mushad sort of a central part of their life. Like they think of mushad as a second home, being raised. And I couldn't. I had a very hard time pulling that off in New York. For different reasons. I mean, one of the reasons, of course, is you know, traffic and commute, and you can't you can't actually pick in New York where you're going to live. You just find a place and you move there, you know. And hopefully, there's a masjid nearby. And it's not always convenient for you to be able to go and things like that. Texas is different because you literally move exactly where you want to move. There's a lot of there's a lot of space, and there's a lot of opportunity to move where you want to move. And plus, it's more affordable. So those are the reasons I considered it. Now, what I think the city can do, what New York can do, especially masjid like JMC. Muslim Center, you know, Salihin even, like, at least the bigger masajid, the bigger ones, the ones that have more space. What you guys can do and what actually, personally I think you need to do if you're not already doing, is create a lot of women's education programs that are run by women, parallel, uh, that are running strong. Uh, you need to empower, like the, the youth group, alhamdulillah, is here, but they should have a solid budget by virtue of which they can take 50, 60 kids, you know, regularly on road trips. Uh, you know, just take the boys out and just go, you know, upstate or something and go hiking or whatever, just do road trips and stuff like that, attend conferences, things like that. It's really important for kids to get out and just hang out among themselves. It builds a culture among them. It builds brotherhood among them. Similarly, the sisters youth group should have its own uh, a budget and they should have their own activities planned out that are, of course, socially acceptable and things like that. You know, Texas, it's a little easier for us because the homes are bigger, they're cheaper and bigger. So sometimes sisters will have like an all girls like party or whatever at somebody's house and they empty out the house of all the men and there's just women there and they're just hang the sisters group is hanging out there or whatever. It's not as easy to do that in New York. You'll get kicked out of your apartment. So 
but you'll have to work with whatever limitations you have here. But what the point of it is, the masjid needs to become a very social place. It's not in the Muslim world. The masjid is a place of worship. In the in America, the masjid is the only place we have to create a community. We're not a community anywhere outside. We're, here's where our community lives, the masjid. So we have to be aware of that and do create opportunities that, that help foster that. My advice to young professionals is, you guys always complain that you don't want to get involved at the masjid because the uncles are just, they want to do things their way or whatever. Well, you know what? You're not going to bring change about overnight, but you become part of it and you agree with the uncles and you work with them and you work with them long enough until you say, uncle, I love you so much, can I do this one little program? And eventually they'll let you do something. And you work your way through, work your way up, and inshallah, you're not, you're not trying to do a coup. That doesn't work. You know? And you don't try to start your own masjid, they spend millions building you know, each masjid. Work with what the masajid are doing, and inshallah, you'll find more and more people open to good ideas, and, uh, and be able to work with you guys, inshallah. Um, should we recite Surah Fatiha behind the Imam? Fifth question, I want to pray inside me, but the outside I don't want to pray. Can you help? Uh, yeah, I can help with that. I think um, there's the, the the if you want to pray inside, meaning just spiritually you want to pray, but actually physically you don't want to pray. That's a form of waswasa of shaitan, because that's actually not prayer. It's not a joke. It's, it's, it, it happens. He'll convince you that you're actually praying, cause, but you're not. Being connected to Allah doesn't count as salat, and this this salat is not something that you know. You say, oh, well, I don't see the point in it. Doesn't matter if you see the point in it or not. Allah gave this as the ultimate gift to the Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This salat, so it's an honor that we get to perform it, and you should take it very seriously. Um, God, you guys have a lot of fit questions. Just taking pictures, haram. Quick, take a picture. Okay, let's <laughs> go. <laughs> In health class in eighth grade, we learn about you know what we learn about. Is this a corruption of the students' souls? I don't recommend health class. I'd rather you have that talk with your children than, than some non-Muslim public school teacher. Decline the health class and teach your have the birds and the bees talk with your children yourself. It's going to be hard, but you got to do it. It's got to be done. And I, I actually tell you, I'm telling you, parents, parents, show of hands, parents in the audience. Okay, you have to have the talk about you know those feelings with your boys, nine years age. At the latest, eight to nine, talk to them. Because they already know several boys that have girlfriends in school. They know, they know, they won't ask them. They'll tell you. Do you know anybody who has a girlfriend? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then. No, I don't. <laughs> they do. Dating is normal in America. Dating, dating first graders are normal in America. Josh loves Samantha. It's all good here. <laughs> you know? So your kids are exposed to that very early on, but you need to be able to have that conversation and remove the mystery from it and be able to let them know that they can talk to you about those feelings. And it's okay. You're, there, and actually, you've got a new challenge now. We've got a new challenge. We have to make sure, on the one hand, our parents are supposed to talk to our boys especially. You know, it's okay if you think a girl is pretty. You're, you, Allah put those feelings in you. And actually it's okay to, have to actually talk about that because now there's another message about having feelings about you know what. So we actually have to counter that. I'm not kidding. Children are being exposed to this stuff. So you know, and the, this conversation needs to happen by the parents. You know, this is part of لِفُرُوجِهِمْ hafidun. You know, that yeah, yeah, you know, men are, men think women are pretty. And you know, Allah put that feeling in us. But we have to work with that and we have to control it. And here's how Allah wants us to deal with it. And those feelings I know will be very strong in you. And you have to have that really tough conversation. And you have to have it not once, but many times. Many times. You have to put your kids on the spot all the time. Hey, so, what's going on in school? Huh? So, well, who are the girls in your class? Hmm? Hmm? Which one is pretty? There are no pretty girls. Really? Nobody's pretty? They're all ugly? Well, there's... <laughs> <laughs> it says ledge without overwhelming him. That's all it says. <laughs> this is an online question. Yeah. 
Cool question. A sister wants to do da'wah work. Oh my god. And attend Islamic, it's okay. And Isla, attend Islamic events on a regular basis. But her parents do not allow this. Instead, her parents want her daughter to earn more, pursue a career, and maybe in the future participate in volunteering. The daughter wants to do both at once because being at home and not involved in the da'wah work is affecting her iman. What can she do? That's obviously not the sister that's asking, that's her friend. What can she do? We all know it's you, sister. It's okay. It's like, <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, navigate it. Cut it down a little bit. Don't attend every event that's out there. Don't be a drill sergeant about that. Just spend a little extra time with your parents. All, every, you know, most of the time when you talk to your parents, don't think that you're, you're, you're on da'wah core, which means every time you talk to your parents, you have to talk about the akhirah. And you have to bring up, you know, al-a'mal as-salihah, etc., etc. No, no, no. When you talk to your parents, talk about your career. Because they love hearing about it, right? So make them happy. Say, you know, I'm, I think I'm getting a promotion. Well, this is happening at work, and that's happening at work. Even if you talk to them about work, even if you don't find it, you know, soul-filling, they'll be so happy that you're worried about your career, and you're advancing in it, and things like that. Come on, be a little more tactful. And, and you, again, don't attend every event out there. Just attend you know, a, a, a lesser amount, inshallah. Um, I chat 24-7. And, and wa I want to pray, but I don't want to get off the laptop. <laughs> Can you tell me what to do? And you spelled what like a person who's on the laptop 24-7. W-U-T, <laughs> what to do? What to do? What is that? <laughs> but anyway, um, I guess I could chat with you. Because <laughs> if I tell you now, I don't know if you're going to hear it. But, uh, uh, but anyway, dude, Facebook and oh, Facebook and while talking? Okay. Yeah, no, uh, just get off. The, people like that, you should just have a Facebook fast, fast, an online fast. Just get off the computer for a whole week. Experience life again. <laughs> you know, because you just, it, it's really, it's really sad. People become really socially awkward and they don't know how to carry normal human interaction anymore because they're addicted to online stuff. Taking pictures are haram, they're not haram. Okay, we got all the opinions here. Um, are there ways to prevent yourself from doing haram things? Yeah, there are. Find, don't be alone, be in better company. If your friends are the ones that encourage you to do those kinds of things, find better friends. Um, spend as much time in good places. Good places could be, for guys, it doesn't have to be the much, you just play basketball or something. Just keep yourself busy with good stuff. Even if it's, it's not Islamic stuff, it's not bad stuff. You know? Just keep yourself busy. And, and I think sports are a really good outlet, personally. Sometimes I forget how many rakat I made. Uh, do a lot of, read a lot of Quran, and uh, that's, a, that's extra waswasa from shaitan. So just make sure you're saying wudu, especially, and you make sure your clothes are clean. Those are spiritual ail ailments for people that forget the rakat and stuff. Can I have your phone number? <laughs> I have a sensitive problem. Oh, you have a sensitive problem. Okay, well, no, I can't give you my phone number. It's, it's public domain, though. You can Google it, I guess. Um, but if you, if you can... Um, if it's that sensitive, you should probably be talking to a counselor in all seriousness. Um, the ruling on delaying salat while traveling, very good. I like your beard. <laughs> I like it too. Squiggle, that's, that's awesome. What's your course's website? It's bayina.tv. Uh, what are ways to bring loved ones towards the understanding and acting upon Islam when we know they simply lack interest and are lazy towards Islam? Be really patient with loved ones. I'm telling you from personal experience. You have to work with loved ones very, very cautiously. And um, they will slowly, they'll take their sweet time coming towards deen. You didn't come to deen because you're a great person. You came to deen, I came to deen because Allah dropped a blessing on us. We, we could have been, well, would have been the kinds of people who don't care about Islam either. So the little we do care about Islam is a gift from Allah Azza wa not our own accomplishment. Okay, so Allah guides whoever He wants, and you're not responsible for changing your family. What you continue to give them is your love, your respect, and they should see that your Islam has made you better towards them, not worse. It's your Islam that's made you a better son, a better husband, a better father, a better brother, etc., etc., 
and slowly their hearts are going get, to start getting softer and softer. The more you try to preach to them, the farther away they'll go, and the more frustrated you'll get. And it'll, it'll just, you know, they'll, they won't want to talk to you because you're not talking to them as a brother or a husband or a wife or a son or a daughter or, you know, they're, you're talking to them as a preacher, as a da'i, as a speaker. It doesn't work. It just simply does not work, you know. And there are people in my family I would love to do da'wah to, but my, my da'wah to them for years has been, I just stay in touch with them. And I help them whenever I can. And then they end up calling me for, hey, what's the du'a for this? Or I'm, I'm trying to do this. Or we're about to have a baby, what should I do? And I, then I slip in things like, hey, are you praying five times a day? No, you really should be because you're having a baby. Okay, okay, I'll do that. And then, so you don't, like, you don't preach it, but if the opportunity comes up, you slip in, slip in a little something, you know? So that's, that's how you have to do it. كيف السبيل إلى خشية الله ومراقبته وما هي أفضل الطرق لحفظ كتاب الله بارك الله فيكم أفضل طريق لحفظ كتاب الله أن تحفظوه صباحا قبل الفجر هذا ما أرشحه أنا باقتراحي أنا sorry sorry okay so the best way to memorize Quran is to like before fajr in my opinion before fajr is juicy your mind is open there's nothing is clear and you get good review done and you get, and most of it's muraja'ah anyway, so that's the best time in my opinion. Now the, the path to developing fear of Allah and becoming more cautious of Allah, that's the question. How do you develop that path? Um, really, this is, I, I don't have the answer to that question. We all have our own struggles and our own challenges. We just have to become more and more, uh, if we, I, I personally believe if we have good, solid attention and uh, uh, courtesy given to every salah, the khushu' and the khashiyah of Allah will come. أنا طالبة جامعية وعند التعامل مع أساتذة لا أستطيع أن أخفض بصري أو وفي معظم الأحيان أوكي what should I can't lower my eyes when I'm interacting with teachers and it creates an awkward situation she asked in Arabic um, yeah that is a tough situation uh, I would ask a faqih about that because that's really a ruling issue it's it's a ruling issue how you know the interaction between student and teacher, but um, I can tell you what I personally do. I personally, if um, a sister asks a question, then and it requires that I make eye contact, I do. That's what I do. I know there's the the, the ruling, and I've talked to ulama about this. That's me personally. I'm not imposing anything on you. It's not a fatwa. But me in the, in, the, in the job that I have as a teacher, sometimes I have to demonstrate things and make sure the student understands. And if I don't stop, and and the student looks like this. If the sister looks like that, then I know she didn't get it. I can't lower my gaze and say, sister, it, or it, or it works like this. The mudaf is like this and this, and she's like... <laughs> it's not going to work. So, I, hey, what are you doing? Pay attention. I'm telling you something right now. Sorry, Ustad. And then they listen. So there are situations where, you know, it's necessary, and uh, I believe there are ulama that have some leeway in that scenario. There are, there are general guidelines in our deen, and then there are specific circumstances where there may be exceptions. But then again, you should speak to a faqih about that in detail. Um, how do you hold on to being dedicated to salah? I find myself wanting to, but somehow, but I can't. I can, can I keep that dedication and responsibility? How do you become patient? Any specific surahs that speak about patience? I talked about patience yesterday. Just become more grateful, you'll become patient. As far as becoming more dedicated to salah, you, have to, you can't just say, I want to, because that's not enough. That doesn't mean you want to. You have to really, really want it. You have to really. I I believe studying things like the importance of salah gets somebody like in order. Maybe you haven't studied what makes it important. Maybe you haven't studied where how Allah talks about salat. Because if you just study how Allah talks about salat, that's enough for somebody to say, you know what, I better take it seriously. You know, one of my favorite examples of the importance of salat. I might as well share with you. It is stellar. Musa alayhi salam climbs up a mountain, is not expecting anything but a bunch of people around a fire that might give him some directions. And he ends up talking to who? He ends up talking to Allah. Can you imagine a man on top of a mountain, a historical event for humanity. A man on top of a mountain talking to Allah. And what's the first thing Allah says to him? Innani an Allah, after telling him to take his shoes off. Interestingly, right? Take his shoes off. فَخْلَعْنَا إِنَّنِي أَنَا اللَّهِ لَا إِلَهَا إِلَّا أَنَا فَاعْبُدْنِي وَأَقِمِ الصَّلَاةَ لِذِكْرِي I am Allah, no one is to be worshipped or obeyed in any way, shape or form besides myself. So be my slave and establish prayer to remember me. 
Allah tells Musa السلام, when he speaks to him personally, Aqimis Salat. And then he adds, not just Aqimis Salat, he says, Aqimis Salat Ali, Dhikri, so you can remember me. You tell me, if there's any human being on the face of this earth who will never forget Allah, I would say it's Musa السلام. Why? Because he personally spoke to him. He personally spoke to him. He, he, if there's one human being that will not forget, it's Musa السلام. I've talked about this before. You talk to somebody famous, do you ever forget? If you get a chance to speak, I got a chance to speak to a great scholar. I, I got to speak to Sheikh Akram Nadwi. I was had the honor of being at his house. I can never forget. I can I remember every word he said. Every word he said. Because I mean, he's one of the great muhaddithun of the ummah today. He's a great alim. You know, I was so honored to be in his company. You know, he's written that 50 volume hadith book about the, all the female collectors of hadith in Islamic history. Al Muhaddithat. 50 volumes. In English. Go figure. And all his other books are in Arabic. Man's no joke. And I'm sitting in his like living room checking out his bookshelf. <laughs> you know, waiting for, for him to bring biscuits and stuff. In Oxford. It's awesome. Well, I can't forget. Now imagine Musa alayhi salam is talking to who? Allah is ne- he's never gonna forget. You know when you bring up, you know who I talk to? <laughs> What's he gonna bring? You know who I spoke to? <laughs> you know? And Allah says, no, 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 that's not really remembering me. Establish prayer so you can remember me. My God. That's salat. That's the ultimate dhikr, even for the man who spoke with Allah directly. Um, how can I be a good example for my little sister? Share stuff with her, be nice to her, don't tell on her, protect her, help her with her homework. When she's taking your stuff, don't flip out. You let her borrow some of your clothes. When she comes and wants to hang out with your friends, let her hang out with your friends. When, when you speak to your mom about her, say good things about her. And when she did something bad to you, don't bring and don't complain to your mother about it. And don't say, you know what Huda did? Huda did, 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 did. Don't do that. Actually back her up. And if she complains about you, then just take it and don't defend yourself. And say, go say sorry to her in front of her. And she will love you. And if not, she will hate you. <laughs> Yeah, my parents are against women. No, no, sorry. <laughs> no, sorry, sorry. My parents are against women going to the masjid. Okay, okay, sorry. <laughs> and tells me to be Muslim secretly. But I would rather go to the masjid because I feel like I'm more positive. Uh, I'm, I'm in a more positive community and there are people with less than a minute ego follow. What is that? Is that English? Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, look, the, the parent thing is always going to be a challenge. And we really need, the ummah really needs the parent versus child discussion. Because we only have lectures about the rights of parents, or we have lectures about the rights of children, but we don't actually have lectures and discussions about real situations that people are going through, and really talking them out. And even though Allah has given in the Qur'an, Allah has given amazing, amazing rights to parents. Unbelievable how many rights Allah has given parents. But Allah did not give those rights to parents as weapons for parents to use against their children. That is a crime, parents. Allah gave you those ayat so you can apply them to your parents, not to your children. You do not quote the ayat, وَبِلْ وَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا to your children. You quote them to yourself so you take care of your parents, every time there are ayat about rights, about rights, they are not on the mustahiq. It's not the person who deserves them that uses those ayat. It's the person who owes them. Or the person who owes them who uses those ayat. But unfortunately in the Muslim culture, because we glorify the rights of parents so much, unfortunately parents themselves have started, uh, not started, they have been taking advantage of that position and really being psychologically, emotionally uh, abusive. They really abuse that role. And it's not right. You are, Allah did not say you are absolutely right in everything you do. Allah did not say that for any human being. You're not. And you cannot just use that, the honor, and your child will honor you, and you children, me and you, whether our parents are right or not, we have to honor them regardless. And the only time we're going to disobey them is when obviously some harm will come or something against our deen will come. That's, we have to disobey them in that case. Because obedience to Allah comes first. 
But that does not mean that in Islam you do not have the right to have a reasonable conversation with your parents. And I do, I do mean reasonable conversation. Angels asked Allah about the creation of Adam. Didn't they? You're creating someone who's gonna spill blood? When you read it like that, it sounds disrespectful, doesn't it? Angel was asking Allah Azza wa Jal, why are you making this creature? But you know what? Their tone is respectful. And they have the right to ask something they don't understand. It doesn't make sense to them. That is not disobedience, it's not disrespect. And that is angels to the Creator. They have a right to ask. How does a child not have a right to ask his parents? This doesn't make sense to me. I don't understand. You can have that conversation with your parents. But you have to maintain the ultimate respect. And you cannot lose your cool. They, however, will lose their cool. They will. And they will be abusive. And they will say very, very mean things. And they'll say, oh, so you can question me now? Why don't you become the parent? And they'll remind you of all the things you've done in your life, and what they did for you, and how this happened and that happened, and they'll, they'll make you feel like scum. And at the end of it all, you will massage their feet, and you will ask the same question again, but mama, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. I love you, but it doesn't make sense. Chalhar, what the It'll happen. And that's fine. And you'll say again, mom, I love you. And I, but it still doesn't make sense. I know I'm Batami, slap me some more, but please tell me, why this doesn't make any sense to me. You can have reasonable conversation with your parents. And, with your, and parents be ready for that. You're not, you can't be quoting the Qur'an when you're not like even asking, you're asking them to do un-Islamic things and then say, وَبِلْ وَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانَ You know, how many parents asking their girls to not wear hijab? So many. So many, take it off. What are you looking like that for? Nobody's gonna marry you looking like that. Why you, Islam says you should blend in. They tell you, Islam says you should blend. And you're like, where does Islam say that? Be respectful. Oh, you're gonna teach this Islam now? Or oh, did you put this thing on? You're a shaykha now? You know? You're a alima? Oh, I'm sorry, we can't ask you anything. No, no, do whatever you want then. Go, go, do whatever you want. And then you feel like ter terrible. But you should act dumb when that happens. When they say, do whatever you want. Say, thank you, mother. I love you. <laughs> Learn to take those tense situations and, and lighten them up. I'm telling you from experience, okay? Every one of us are going to have challenge with our parents. We're just in that age, in the era where, where parents are, were raised in a very different world than you were raised in, and the world is changing so fast that miscommunication and misunderstandings are going to happen. But at the end of the day, they still love you. No matter what they've done, they still have some weird way of showing that love, it may be. It's a way that you don't understand. And you say, how could that be love? But it is. But you have to maintain you know, a respectful relationship, a, mo a moderate relationship with them. But there has to now begin to happen some serious, like serious respect, you know, mutual negotiation. Especially about the subject of marriage. Boys in the audience here, start talking to your parents about marriage. What age do you think I should get married? Your mom will slap you the first 10 times you bring it up. <laughs> the 11th, 12th time, you can start. To, nobody's going to be good, for, good enough for you. They say, <laughs> my favorite expression in Arabic, they say, Al-qirdu fi ayni ummihi ghazal. Al-qirdu fi ayni ummihi ghazal. They say, in the eyes of the mother, even the monkey looks like a gazelle. <laughs> so, to you, your mother, to your mother, you're a gazelle. You are this exotic creature. <laughs> to everyone else, you're a gorilla. But that's okay. <laughs> but talk to your dad about marriage. Yeah. And have, have a reasonable conversation. Your dad can, he'll relate. Because he went through what you're going through. <laughs> he can relate. Um, In high school, I had a point in my life where I experienced an Islam high. I hope that's the only high you experienced, my friend. <laughs> Recently, I the past few months, I can't find a way to reach that level of faith. No matter how many lectures I attend, how many, how, how many hours I pray, what is wrong with me? Do I... Do I... Relight? How do I relight the fire? Okay, that's a good question. You know, there are spiritual highs in our life, uh, and they, they come and they go and they disappear. What you, my recommendation for you know, missing that time, uh, sometimes we're never able to bring it back and we long for it. And I personally feel like that. I felt like I was a lot more spiritual when I was in college. I, I personally feel like that. That I'm a lot less spiritual now than I was in college. But probably the reason for that is I was a lot less busy and I, I just have a lot more time for ibadah. So even if I, did ibadah, if I do ibadah now, other things are on my mind more. When I did ibadah, then only ibadah was on my mind. right? So... They, they may, that may have something to do with it. But increasing recitation of Qur'an, conscious recitation of Qur'an, is a very good way of rekindling that fire of Iman. 
how can you give da'wah to your girlfriends? <laughs> or encourage them to be more religious without offending or losing them? I'm, I'm, the sister asked. I'm, I'm assuming. I'm assuming. So sister, you can encourage your girlfriends to be more religious uh, just by being a good friend and you know, just reminding them of Allah's favors. Things that soften the heart. Don't, the do's and don'ts come eventually. Don't, don't be a, you know, the Sharia police with your friends. Because that just doesn't last. Also, if you have a, good, like a large company of friends that aren't obedient to Allah, you should probably find better company. Uh, what do you think MSAs lack? Uh, yeah. And should concentrate on. MSAs lack... Oh boy. Yeah, they do lack members. Uh, they do lack members. MSA, MSA lacks, uh, in my opinion, MSA lacks... Um, no, organization is fine. It, it, it lacks the understanding of what it is. You're not, you're not Islam on campus. You're a place where Muslims feel comfortable coming. And if the, if the opportunity presents itself, you can also teach something about Islam. Or have somebody come and teach something about Islam. But more important than anything else, that's a place, it's a spiritual and socially safe place for Muslims to be. And you have to recognize the fact that there are all kinds of Muslims. It's not like the masjid. There are all kinds of Muslims. There are Muslims that don't pray at all. There are Muslims that, you know, there are girls that don't even look Muslim. But they're Muslims. There are guys that, are, that are, have all kinds of lifestyle, but they're Muslim. And maybe the only exposure they'll ever get, ever get to Islam is the MSA. I was one of those guys. And if my MSA was like some of your MSAs nowadays, that look at a guy that's not religious and they just scoff at him and like, what's this guy doing here? Then I probably would never even come back towards Islam. Right? So the MSA is supposed to be a place where you, you respect people for who they are. You don't tolerate the wrong thing. You don't make it right. You don't say what you're doing is right. But you don't condemn people for what the, where the, the place they are in. You know, this is, a, this is a difficult time for the Ummah. A lot of people are very far from Islam. You don't want to push them further away. So it is a difficult challenge for the MSA and you don't, you don't be frustrated with people, MSA presidents and, and secretaries and treasurers. Don't be disappointed with people. Just do your part and that's it. And it's a good, good training for you to learn to, to be shepherds because you have to deal with all kinds of personalities and all kinds of weird, like insensible things at the MSA. And that's okay, you learn, you do whatever you can. You'll never be able to please everyone. Just do a good job and be genuine to yourself inshallah ta'ala and that's all that you can do. Um, can you highlight or give some insight on females gaining knowledge in this deen by traveling from home? I continuously hear men in my family telling me not to even consider it because it's beyond my role as a girl. Uh, I don't believe that personally. Um, I, again, it's a fiqh issue, so you should consult ulama about this issue, about you know, females traveling and stuff. But um, what's to say you can't take, you know, or your, your, uh, it's not a cut, cut and dry thing. So for example, your, your mahram travels with you and you're living among other sisters and then your mahram comes back. And when you have to travel, he travels back with you. So there, there, there's more gray than, than there is black and white in this sort of thing, right? Uh, the other thing also is, Alhamdulillah, in our campus at Bayina, there are about 60 students every year. 30 of them are brothers and 30 of them are sisters. And a, a good maybe 40, 30% of the sisters are married and their husbands are also in the program. But a good number of sisters are actually from out of state that come and they live with each other in apartments. Their parents, of course, bring them. And they live and they make sure that their housing is safe and they're taken care of, etc., etc. But then they live among each other and they have a, their own little sister's community that comes. And I mean, I've, before I approved of that myself, I consulted ulama that I personally trust, uh, like, you know, like Sheikh Abdul Nasser and even Sheikh Umar Suleiman, other scholars, and they had no problem with it, and that's good enough for me. Inshallah ta'ala. But I mean, parents not bringing it up, somebody's baby's crying. Take care of them. They'll take a walk, he's too hot, he's tired. Oh, he's sleep talking. Oh. Don't laugh, come on. This kid's having, he's been sitting there forever. So boring. Yeah. So, but, but sisters uh, uh, seeking knowledge, um, I, your parents have reservations and they have a right to. It's a bad world out there. So, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's dangerous. I mean, I, I, I would think twice about sending my own daughter somewhere to study. I, I, I'm not going to lie. It's not, it's not an easy decision. And I commend the parents who make that decision. We're trying to make it as easy for them as possible to make that decision, but that doesn't make it an easy decision, sending your daughter away from home. It's a very hard decision, especially for you know, an average Muslim family. It's very, very difficult. 
Um, there's the last one, right? <laughs> what advice can you give to the brothers who are struggling to pay for the bills and they drink because they're depressed? What kind of advice can you give to someone who drinks and has bad habits? Yeah, drinking is a common problem now. You wouldn't believe it, but drinking is a common problem among Muslim men now. And, you know, obviously the Muslim who does it already knows it's haram. And at the beginning, the Muslim feels bad when he does it. And then later on he says, but no, the Qur'an just says wine and I'm just having beer. So he starts making, you know, other excuses. And then he comes up with another one. Qur'an just says that, you know, you, you shouldn't drink when, you know, if it intoxicates you, but it doesn't have an effect on me. Well, the fact that you're saying that is actually pretty good proof that you're drunk out of your mind. But, you know, <laughs> but um, so the people go through phases like that. But re- usually it's... The cause of it is something, it's not the taste of alcohol, it's ex- escape from reality and depression. And for that you really have to see a counselor. You really have to see a counselor. And you have to remember that Allah will forgive this sin. This is a major sin, it's not a light sin. It's a major, major haram in our religion. But Allah, it's not, you're not beyond forgiveness. And it's not like you can't recuperate from this. But you, you'll have to make that decision for yourself. Okay, I can take a couple more. Uh, what is? What's that word? People have horrible handwriting here. You can't tell, can you? Mentos? Okay. All right, so as I leave you guys, I'll give you something beneficial, inshallah, for myself and for all of you. I'll give you two, at least one of my favorite du'as. I'll give one of my favorite du'as of the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, uh, and it, I, I, there's a really cool story behind this du'a for me too. I, you know, I, was, I, I took a couple of books of du'a on the day of Arafah for Hajj, and I went through all of them. I just sat the entire day and just made du'a. It was beautiful. It was absolutely amazing. And there are some du'as that just hit me, like really hard. And I made them like a thousand times. You know, same du'a. And, you know, I didn't see anybody that I knew in our group. Our, our Hajj group leader was Shaykh Omar Sulaiman, who I love to death. And uh, even though he's really tall and, you know, scary looking. But anyway, so he, after we were done with the Yawm al-Arafah, he came over and he said, so what was your favorite du'a? And I was like, I'm not going to tell you, you tell me. So I was like, okay, let's say it together. On the count of three. One, two. Three, and we said the same du'a. It was awesome. It was awesome. So what's the du'a? I forgot. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Um, uh, it's actually, Allahum marzuqni rizqan tayyiban. Oh Allah, give me good, clean, pure rizq. Okay? First of all, provide me good, clean, pure rizq. Wa amalan, wa ilman nafi'an. And give me beneficial knowledge. وَعَمَلًا مُتَقَبَّلًا And give me actions that are accepted by you. Three things. Give me good rizq, give me beneficial knowledge, and allow me, gift me with deeds that you accept. That's all we can ask for in this life. It covers everything. At the end of the day, if we have good rizq, then everything we spend it on, and, and, and we use it for, it will have barakah in it. The knowledge that we acquire, so long as it's beneficial. So long as we, what we acquire is... By, what, is what does it mean, nafi'? يعني, uh, يَجْعَلُكَ مُؤْمِنًا أَكْثَرْ It'll make you a better... Or أَحْسَنْ It'll make you a better believer. Right? عِلْمًا نَافِعًا And what should happen after knowledge? But not just any action. It's so beautiful, so prophetic. عَمَلًا مُتَقَبَّلًا Action that is accepted by Allah. Give me, you gift me with action that you will accept, Ya Rabbi. So Allahumma arzuqni rizqan tayyiban wa ilman nafi'an wa amalan mutaqabbalan. So I'm going to ask all of you guys to make this dua with me. I'll break it up for you so you can repeat it with me. And we'll conclude today's session, okay? Allahumma arzuqni rizqan tayyiban wa ilman nafi'an wa amalan mutaqabbalan. Ameen ya Rabbil Alameen. Barakallahu alaykum. Thank you so much for your patience and listening. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.